Good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody doing? All right, welcome to our presentation. My name is Billy Ebersole. I'm an FBI agent. I am stationed up in Williamsport. I've been there almost 18 years. I've been an agent for a total of 21 and a half years and am eligible to retire very shortly. So it's an exciting time for me. This will not be a technical presentation today. It's going to be more in the nature of risk assessment, the types of threats that we see out there. And there are a couple of disclaimers that I want to give you up front. Number one, these are my opinions of where the issues are at, not the FBI's or the U.S. government. Number two, we'll have some different examples of what we're looking at in terms of cyber crime, cyber terrorism, and cyber espionage. But by no means do we try and imply that these problems are unique to any one country or culture or people. They're problems that the whole world deals with, including the United States. And I'll give you one final disclaimer that's not up there. There are certain things and certain aspects of the Internet that bother law enforcement and the intelligence community a little bit more than the average person. And I'll give you an example, the dark web. And we'll talk about that a little bit. There are some folks in the community that are very comfortable with the dark web. We'll talk a little bit in a generic sense about the dark web because it's very problematic for us, especially in the area of pedophiles. Now, I've been in the FBI for about 21 and a half years. I am not a technical person. I work on the Child Exploitation Task Force. My background, drugs, counterterrorism, and white collar crime, the fraud type stuff. Back in August, I took over our Child Exploitation Task Force, which is comprised of federal, state, and local law enforcement officers who investigate pedophiles. These are the people that go on and try and exploit children, entice them to cross state lines for sexual purposes, or perhaps produce child pornography. It's a very serious offense. What I do and what I've come to do out here for the past 18 years is rely on my task force officers. So we have a variety of persons today who came out from my office and certainly during the presentation or afterwards will be available to assist you with any questions on their insight from their perspective and also on career opportunities because that's important to a lot of you who are students in the law enforcement arena. It's a very informal presentation so I would ask you if you have any questions, just raise them, bring them up, and if I can't answer them, my task force officers up front will answer them for you. And I'll just introduce them to you real quick. This is Jason Bolt, who is an agent with the Williamsport Police Department. He's new on our task force. This is Stefan. He's a forensic investigator with the Pennsylvania State Police. Next to him is Joe Wondolowski, who is actually with Bloom University PD. I have been working with Joe since 1999 and we've done a lot of different capers together in a variety of arenas. Next to him is Mike Fossey, who's a Bloom police officer, and he is also coming onto our task force. Downstairs we have literature for recruitment, and we have Corporal Chris Hill from the Pennsylvania State Police Cybercrime Unit. Now, this is about information security and assurance, and many of you who are part of this terrific program here for digital forensics will go on to help the government protect very sensitive information. For example, your personal identifiable information. No one wants to go through that being compromised. And I had to go through that. A couple years ago, the Office of Personnel Management was hacked by a foreign country. And not only did all of my records get compromised, but so did my wife's because she used to be a bureau employee for about seven years. Now, when you work in the federal government, you have to have a security clearance. So they go back and they get all of your family members. They get your addresses for 20 years, your name, your date of birth, your social security number. There is a lot of medical information. There is a lot of bio data, for example, your fingerprints that are all contained in your personnel record. And unfortunately for many of us in the U.S. government, over 20 million of us, our records have been compromised. So we feel what a lot of our victims go through when we deal with the, the hacking and the intrusions. Uh, HIPAA, the Health Information Portability and Accountability Act, is an incredible piece of legislation out there that regulates the healthcare industry. The fines are enormous. And quite frankly, I don't know how folks work in the medical arena because of the constraints that they operate under. It now looks more and more like encryption will be the path for many of these folks. It makes it more difficult, more, 
more expensive, but certainly we want to protect our health information. Not only is it important so that our, our intimate medical details don't get out there, but there's also a tremendous underground um, market for personally identifiable information related to health care. They call it a kits. So if you can go online or retrieve a complete set of a person's health care data, which would be their name, date of birth, their SOCH, their medical code, um, their health care providers, their insurance codes, group codes, stuff like that, you could sell it uh, probably for about $250 to $500 currently. It used to be a lot more, but the market's getting flooded with it, unfortunately. To contrast that, if you have a stolen credit card number, that might go for a dollar or two to another criminal. So medical information on the Internet is at a premium. And the reason why it's a premium is because some of the criminals will go out and use that information to go to a physician. They'll get something like oxycodone, very strong prescription drug. They'll sell it, maybe $30 a tablet. They'll use that money to buy into uh, cocaine, heroin, the higher value hardcore drugs and make an awful lot of money. So we need folks like the digital forensics majors here at Bloomsburg to help us protect that information. Whether they're employed by the government or they're employed by private industry, there's a tremendous need. In fact, I read a statistic about two weeks ago. By the year 2020, there will be a need for 1.4 million graduates in some type of cybersecurity discipline. And it's estimated by 2020, there will only be about 400,000 graduates who are competent in that area. So it's a wide open field for everyone. Now, on the federal level, when we look at risk, the way the government works, it's round peg, round hole. You have a particular violation, you put people to work it. So we have divided the cyber threat into risks that come from cyber criminals, cyber spies, and cyber terrorists. So I thought about today, <coughs> we just talk about a couple of examples from each of these threats. Now there's a couple basic concepts that I want to convey to you. When we are talking about threats, we are talking about an advanced persistent threat. So that's not the proverbial high school kid that's depicted in the media you know, inadvertently hacking into a Department of Defense database and causing a global thermal nuclear war. These are folks that are organized. They're members of a nation group, they're members of an organized criminal group, or even a terrorist group. They are long term. These folks do not go in and deface a website <coughs> or steal a bunch of data and run out. We have seen advanced persistent threats that last in a system for beyond four years. So these are folks that have a plan. They go in and they're looking for specialized targets. A very interesting read that I would recommend is Verizon, the phone company. They do a database intrusion report every year. And the report that was published in 2016 talked about all of the hacks that were in 2015. And they noticed that about 89% of those hacks or compromises related to some kind of financial or economic motive. That meant that the hackers were going in there maybe to get intellectual property or vendor information, process information. We see a lot of that with the energy industry. So I like to contrast that because sometimes the media portrays the hacks as maybe looking just for Department of Defense information. And that's still an important target. but what really drives this country and gives us a lot of power is the robustness of our economy and private industry. And we have outside groups and outside countries coming in and trying to steal the research and development efforts and dollars from our private country, from our industry, and for us in the government, that is becoming more and more of an area that we want to protect and we want to defend. When we look at these hackers, we have a tendency to think that they're sophisticated. And I think some of them are very sharp. Some of the ones that I've come across or read about. But phishing still remains one of their top attack vectors, spear phishing, where you get that unsolicited email, you open it up, it's an executable file, and then all of a sudden your computer's doing some crazy things and someone's exfiltrating your most sensitive data. And I encourage folks, even within the FBI, as recently as January of this year, we were hit with a spear phishing email on our outside government accounts and we actually had 120 employees open up those emails. So this is something, it's a lesson for all of us. We need to be careful, we need to make sure that we're monitoring our emails and it's not overly sophisticated. We talked to a bunch of folks that went through uh, the vendor area downstairs and a lot of the issues related to technology and I think technology is important 
but I also think our behavior is very important, how we conduct ourselves, how much we put on the internet about ourselves. In fact, in that Verizon study I referenced, there, it was estimated that about 80% of the hacks in 2015 could have been prevented by what's called cyber hygiene, changing your password, using a strong password, updating your patches. In fact, in 2015, 83% of the hacks could have been prevented by a patch to software, which was available at the time of the intrusion. So some of the basics, and I speak a lot maybe to rotary clubs and churches and other forms of private industry, technology is important, but we never want to forget about the basics. <clears throat> now another key concept is attribution, and there's been a lot in the news about different types of intrusions, much of which I can't talk about today because there's ongoing investigations, but I always <coughs> get a chuckle at these news commentators who will say the hack or the intrusion came from this country or that country, certain group of people are to blame. That is a very difficult thing to do from a law enforcement perspective. As law enforcement officers, we have to develop probable cause to say not just did this computer participate in the intrusion, but we have to put someone actually behind that keyboard, someone manipulating the software and the hardware for ill-gotten gain. And it is very difficult to put a single person or a group of persons that you can charge behind the keyboard. And I bring this up because I want you to remember when you're out watching the news and there's all kinds of allegations, just consider all sides involved. And remember that when we have to do this in a court of law, there are a lot more constraints. It's easy for folks to suspect or give conjecture on who made a particular intrusion, but when it comes down to proving it, there's a whole lot more work that has to go into it. Now, when we talk about cybercrime, there's two things that we could be talking about. Number one, the computer is the target of the attack. Or number two, the computer is the instrumentality. So if we look at a computer being the target of attack, maybe a hacker is going in to steal some intellectual property. Or conversely, maybe the computer is being used as part of a botnet, where a series of computers are being taken over and they're being used to do a distributed denial of service attack or something like that. So our analysis of cybercrime is divided twofold. Is the computer a victim or is it an instrumentality? Now, ransomware is really out of control, and I was glad to see today that there was a presentation on ransomware. I didn't get to it, but I will watch it online once the video is uploaded. And this is just an example I downloaded off the Internet. It purports to be an email from the FBI saying, we have figured out that there is some form of child pornography and other unpleasantries on your computer. If you don't pay us a certain amount of money, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. I can assure you, if we think there is kitty porn on your computer, we will not be sending you an email. <laughs> what you will hear is a very faint knock at your door, someone whispering, FBI, open up, and then shortly thereafter, you'll hear the crash of a battering ram hitting the brass on your front door as we rush in to get you and your computer. That's not how we operate. This is a good example, but there's other ones out there. For example, you will get an email from the IRS saying, you owe us a whole bunch in taxes, send us several hundred dollars in Bitcoin or whatever. That's not how government actors operate. Typically, you might see some type of official correspondence or you're going to get a visit in person. And this has been so bad, in 2016 we saw a 300% increase. We're getting about 4,000 attacks a day on the internet just due to ransomware. So this is a very serious problem. There are very, very much efforts going into resolving this, but the one thing that we can all do is make sure that we do our backups, that we have our most sensitive information backed up on a regular basis. Why would you think hospitals are very susceptible to ransomware? Any thoughts out there? Go ahead.
Yeah, that's a good point. They have medical data, and what happens with medical data? You need it right away, so there's some built-in pressure. The physicians, nurses, and other medical professionals absolutely need to get access at the information as long and as quick as they need it. Yes, sir? It is expensive updating the hardware. Go ahead. They can use it for blackmail. They can use it for the black market. And what is that 500-pound sledgehammer that's hanging over every hospital and every medical provider's head? HIPAA. So they know there's incredible fines, and they're going to want to minimize the damage so hospitals are more inclined to pay up and pay up rather quickly. In fact, it's about a year ago a hospital was hit with a ransomware attack out in the Hollywood area. The demand started out to be a million bucks. I think it was somewhat much less, but they did pay it. And actually, we have had law enforcement agencies pay the demand in Bitcoin because it is very difficult to get the technical resources out there. Some of the small departments out in the West um, have acquiesced to the demands and hopefully sub subsequently have put in um, some countermeasures to prevent that, but it is an unfortunate reality because of the gravity of what happens when your files get erased or encrypted to the point where you can't use them. It's a tremendous impact on the government entity. So always back up your information. Now when we talk about cyber espionage, we're talking about the use of the computer to get information, primarily intellectual property, vendor information, stuff like that, and you're doing it illegally. So you're accessing somebody else's work product in a hope to make some type of gain. That's in particular what we see in the cyber espionage arena. Now it's not just Department of Defense information that people were accessing. 89% of it in 2015 had some type of financial or economic nexus. It's estimated that we're losing about a million jobs a year out of the U.S. economy just due to cyber espionage alone, and that is just limiting it to the nation state sponsors. And the estimated cost is about $120 billion per year just due to the theft of intellectual property. Now this is a picture of the F-35 fighter. The top one is the U.S. and the bottom one is the Chinese counterpart. And they look dramatically similar. I'm not an aviation expert by any stretch of the imagination, but they look similar. And there was a case started a couple years ago. It was resolved the summer of 2016. There was a gentleman named Su Bin who was working for a U.S. defense contractor out on the West Coast. And at some point, Su Bin had been compromised. And he admitted during his trial or his guilty plea proceedings that his motivation was economic. He needed the money. He got thousands of dollars from a couple of folks who were operating in the country of China. Whether or not they were acting at the request of the Chinese government, I can't tell you, but based on what's on the internet, he had two handlers overseas that were directing him. Now, Su Bin himself did not do a lot of the hacking. What he was doing is translating documents, he was identifying locations within the network where the compromise would be easier, and he was identifying locations within the network where the information was more readily accessible. And for that, he got himself a 46-month sentence um, in a United States penitentiary, which started, I believe, last July. Now, throughout the course of this investigation, some of the information was put on the Internet. And one of the things that I thought was most interesting was an email that was intercepted from one of Sue's handlers over in China telling Sue basically thank you for all this information and the quote was the information that you have gathered has allowed us to stand on the shoulders of the giant meaning the United States government is the giant and now we're standing on their shoulders or we took advantage of all of their intellectual property and we have built our own um, fighter that is consistent in terms of performance and capabilities as the US F-35. Now this is upsetting for two reasons. Number one, we want our soldiers and sailors out on the battlefield to have the best advantage. We want them to have the product of the ingenuity here in the United States. But also number two, we want the companies that devoted their time and resources to develop these products to reap the financial reward. And so we are looking as a government to protect our companies that operate. We do a robust outreach with a lot of these folks through a program called InfraGuard. In 2007, 
the FBI realized we're not keeping up with the cyber threat. We don't have the technology, we don't have the trained personnel, so we turn to academia and we turn to private industry and we form chapters. We have a chapter here in Harrisburg, we have a chapter here in Williamsport, and it's certainly open to students, where we meet a couple times a year and we talk to members of banks and manufacturing firms and energy firms and we talk about different types of things that they're seeing because they're the eyes and ears and they come forward to us in a discreet manner and they give us a heads up on different things that might be going on in terms of how they're being attacked, how their systems are being breached and what their patches are all about. So it is something that you might want to consider throughout your academic career when you graduate and land a nice job. Um, information sharing in this particular arena has become very important because we're all in this battle together. Now out here we have another area that I think is important, and if you're out in this area, you know about the Marcellus Shale. There's a lot of development, there's a lot of exploration. Right now, we have 17 new pipeline projects going in the Marcellus Shale region. And once those pipelines are hooked up within the next year, year and a half, we're going to have approximately 17 and a half billion cubic feet of natural gas going from this area to diverse areas throughout the United States and ultimately off the East Coast, it's going to be going overseas. There is a particular vulnerability that we have noticed generically in the energy industry but throughout industry and it's called SCADA systems. SCADA stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition System. So it's basically a computer system that will run a physical process. Um, it runs pipelines, it could run nuclear plants, it runs the electrical grid, and we have noticed a huge vulnerability with SCADAs. And that vulnerability is people don't change the default password. In fact, the default password has been so pronounced as a vulnerability that a team of Russian scientists last year published a list on the internet with the 100 top default passwords for SCADA systems. They did this in the hopes that the manufacturers of the systems and the companies that buy them will start changing up the passwords a little bit. And there's another issue, in particular with pipelines. The SCADA systems are designed to be long-term systems. And the, the controllers that they operate, the programmable logic controllers that they operate, will last a long time. Some of them could be 20 and 30 years. You might have different manufacturers that come and go into business, so the pipeline itself may have multiple components from different manufacturers in different decades. That makes patching and updating very difficult. So we as a government are concerned about our pipelines. Now we're not concerned from almost like a kinetic standpoint or the standpoint of is somebody going to attack us. A lot of what you can glean from a SCADA system you could pick up from Google Earth in terms of where the pipeline is at. But the SCADAs have been seen as a back door into the informational technology system and there's a particular malware out there called um, Night Dragon that originally was used against financial institutions to develop account information, but the hackers who employ Night Dragon have seen that it has other benefits. They call it a Swiss Army knife because it's deployable in multiple arenas. And with that being said, it is used to hit the energy companies, in particular pipeline companies. Energy companies are losing on average about eight and a half million dollars per day each and every day due to the compromise of their computer systems. 50% of the compromises come from attacks on SCADA systems. So as these new pipelines come into effect here in the Marcellus Shale region, we're going to be spending a lot of time with these companies doing what we call um, preparedness drills. Maybe we sit down as a group and talk about what would happen, simulate if there was a compromise, how would we respond to it, and then maybe we do a full-scale exercise where in a very limited way we introduce something that disrupts the SCADA or the IT system of the company. So SCADAs are very important. The next thing we'll talk about is cyber terrorism. To us in the federal government, cyber terrorism is really terrorism. It relates to the use or threatened use of force to affect some kind of social, economic, philosophical, or religious, political goal, whatever it is. So you're, you're using force or you're threatening force. And the same thing with the computer. You want to effectuate some kind of threat to bring about a change that you were looking for. Now, most of us are aware of Las Vegas, and there's all kinds of casinos out there. One of the bigger ones is the Sand Casino.
What you may not know is that the Sands Casino also has a branch out in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And the CEO of Sands Casino a couple years ago made some very unpleasant remarks towards Iran. And I don't advocate making unpleasant remarks towards anyone. Someone took offense to that and they took very grave offense to that. And what they did <coughs> through a passworking they used a password dictionary to crack the server out in Bethlehem. And they found a technician who had access both to Bethlehem and to the Las Vegas Sands where all the data was at. And they went in and they wiped data. It's estimated that there was over $40 million in damage. And what I would suspect, too, is not just the $40 million in damage, but they probably got a lot of credit card information, don't you think? And what happens when there's a credit card breach? Anybody know? Anybody know what the payment card industry data security standards are? Go ahead. All right. Well, we talked a lot about government regulation, but there's a lot of private industry regulation that's impacted by cybersecurity. <coughs> and here's an example. American Express, Discover Card, MasterCard, and Visa several years ago got together and they formed what were called the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standards. So if you have a swipe machine where you process credit card transactions, whether you're Target or you're some mom and pop bakery or flower shop down the street, you are subjected to the data security standards. If you mess up and there is a breach the Payment Card Industry Data Security Council will come after you. They might suspend your privileges to process credit card. They might hit you with fines. And I know with the Target breach, I saw a couple months ago that there was a pro pro proposed resolution by Visa for something like a $40 million fine. And that was just Visa. That wasn't the other three major credit card reporting companies. And it also wasn't the private litigation that was going on. So some pretty substantial issues are still to come out of this breach. Now this is a sad case. Our debt for easy was a 21-year-old male, probably a little bit disillusioned, frustrated with the US. He was in Kosovo. And he hacked into a server that contained the information of US government employees, both civilian and military. And he took that information and he posted it online with all of their personally identifiable information. And it became what the US government characterized as a cyber hit list. The, the implication that the government put forward in the prosecution was this was basically go find these people and do some damage to them. And it was very upsetting being a federal civilian employee for me to see that out there. Junaid Hussein, who was an ISIS jihadist, tweeted a link to that information in what we would represent would be an endorsement, like here are the bad guys, go after them. Farizi was found. I think ultimately he was arrested in Malaysia. He confessed, he was convicted, and as a 21-year-old man, he got 20 years in prison. And I thought that was, you know, it's a tragic waste of life for putting something like this on the internet when so much more potential was from this man. Uh, sometime subsequent, Hussein was killed in an airstrike. The young man there it doesn't look like he even shaves, and the, probably the most significant part of his life, unfortunately, is going to be spent in a US jail. What I thought was important, and I wanted to bring it out to all of you, was during the course of that investigation, an email came out. And it's, it's kind of a chilling statement. We are in your emails and your computer system, watching and recording every move. We have your names and addresses. We are in your emails and your social media accounts. And isn't that an admonishment to us to be very careful about what we put out there on the internet? When it comes to Facebook and other things like that, our postings, we want to be careful. We want to give it a second thought. I know with us, and with future employers, when you go through and you become a federal agent or a federal employee, you have to have a security clearance. It is now becoming mandatory when we get our clearance and when we have our review every five years, we have to give over all of our social media account information so that they can check us and make sure we're not putting improper items on social media. Employers are doing that as well. So think about your future job, your future spouse, or whatever, when you're tempted to put up some of that craziness on social media because it is permanent. No matter how much you delete it, somebody somewhere out there has some kind of copy of it. And you never know who's watching your social media. So 
information assurance, all that really is, it's protecting our most important data. We want to keep it confidential, whether it's medical data or your social security number, you don't want people looking at it. We want to maintain the integrity of our data. That means we want it accurate, we want it reliable, whether it's a bill that goes to a customer or a criminal investigative file. We want to make sure that we maintain the integrity. And finally, we want it available. We want to make sure that we can access our critical data whenever we need it. So if we are working on a patient who has a pacemaker and we're accessing that pacemaker results through Wi-Fi, we want to make sure those accurate results are conveyed to us whenever we need it at any time, night or day. So when you go back to class or you go back to your job, you can tell your coworkers that you learned about the CIA from the FBI today. And we did not say one thing bad about them openly. So with that, I wanted to ask, are there any questions? Any thoughts? Go ahead. Yes, that was a study done by Hillary Heilman back in 2011. In what sense? Okay, what they're looking at is all kinds of financial data. For example, customer list, vendor list, the proprietary information, what goes into composing frac mud when they're, they're doing their drilling, stuff like that. Yes. Yes. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. I would say they're under-reporting because of the incredible fines. And not just the fines, the lawyer fees and the compliance. And just so we're all on the same sheet of music, what the gentleman is asking is, why doesn't the number of reportings going to the government match the actual breaches? Is that what you're saying? And so you know how it works. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Office of Civil Rights Enforcement, is responsible for enforcing on the federal level, uh, the implications for when there's a breach with protected health information. And what that does is it basically requires voluntary self-disclosure to the U.S. government. This is the breach. This is what we think happened. These are the number of records affected. From my perspective, even as a federal agent, that's a very scary thing for private industry to do. And I can tell you, um, it's it can be equivalent to opening a Pandora's box. I would hope that's not the case, but there are folks who would come up here and say they had very unpleasant circumstances. And I'll give you an example. The Cancer Care Group, which was out in Western Ohio about two years ago, had a physician take a laptop and a thumb drive home with the records, I think it was about 22,000 patients between the thumb drive and the laptop. He left it on the back seat of his very fancy car went to dinner, somebody smashed the window, they took the laptop, and they took the thumb drive. They did self-disclose. The fine was 750000 And that's the tip of the iceberg, and I'll tell you why. Because they had to pay attorneys probably charging 600 to $800 an hour to come in and represent them in front of the United States Department of Health and Human Services Office of Civil Rights Enforcement. And then at some point, the government may have ordered like a compliance monitoring program. That means folks like all of you who are technically skilled and can do information technology audits had to come in and they had to evaluate the system. And one of the things that bothered the government in that particular case was there were prior breaches and also they didn't have a plan. How do we deal with removable media? Do we encrypt it? Do we not allow it to be taken out? Stuff like that. So I would surmise that the 750000 was a lot cheaper than the compliance plan, the audits, and the lawyer's fees throughout. Um, another thing that you should be aware of, and it's a nice employment opportunity, the Federal Trade Commission 
is the commission that regulates unfair business practice. Most of you have probably gotten a, an email or a crazy phone call saying, I am a prince from this foreign country, I need to get 150000 out, just give me your account number, and I will treat you like royalty when I land in the United States. It's completely bogus. That is one of the jobs of the Federal Trade Commission. A couple years ago, the Federal Trade Commission took the official position, businesses that fail to have adequate cybersecurity are engaged in unfair business practices similar to that hypothetical prince. And they are enforcing it. And in fact, the U.S. federal courts are backing the FTC's position. And a very famous case a couple months came out with Wyndham Hotel. They had a compromise with their credit cards, very similar to Cancer Care Group, very substantial fines. And I think their audits were 10 years or 20 years where they had to have some type of corporate compliance monitoring. So. Um, very expensive. Attorney's fees and the monitoring, definitely an area where you can get into. I talked to a number of students today who like to do the IT audits. Um, it's not something I'm capable of doing, but it can become very lucrative and it becomes very important. You don't want to be a corporation exercising your corporate authority under the supervision of the U.S. government. It's too much. You won't last in business. Any other questions? Well, I can give you my personal position. I can't give you the FBI's position, but I'm a big trainer and I'm big into policy. I think one of the biggest issues that companies are going to face in the private arena is bring your own device. How do you say to a very accomplished physician down at Geisinger, you can't use your iPhone to issue a diagnosis or prescribe medication? And multiply that by there's thousands of physicians that are just incredible right down the street from here. So I think corporate America has to recognize that. You're going to have one type of phone. I'm going to have a different type of phone. Your patching might be updated. Mine isn't. There's a host of issues that we certainly should be addressing from a technological perspective. But I think co-committing with that is we have to do the training. And we have to test on the training. And if the person doesn't abide by the training, we have to be prepared to implement consequences. There's no consequences unless you can show that they understood from an HR perspective the training. But I, I feel very strong about policy and training, at least as important as the technology. Any other questions? I, I think it's a problem. Um, <clears throat> there are ways to work around that. We want the hard drive. That would be the primary evidence. But there's other things we can do. Maybe this person has sent an email or he's emailed information to a person who's cooperating. So we would ideally like to see their hard drive, but we can go to the ISP or we can go to a cooperator and see if we can get their assistance. Um, there are a lot of measures, and I can't give out too many company secrets here, but there are measures that are employed to make sure that we can get a hold of that hard drive before it gets encrypted, which is the ideal resolution. Okay. <coughs> Any other questions? All right, go ahead. Yeah, no, and that's a good point because this is, we have a lot of students here and we want to talk about employment opportunities for just a bit. And as I mentioned earlier on, we are a task force here, so these gentlemen work on the federal, state, and local level. There are good things and bad things about every agency. I love where I'm at, but I recognize the fact that my rules and regulations and management would drive most people insane. So the FBI isn't the only place that you want to come in to work. It is a frequent concern for folks coming in. They may have made a misstep growing up. 
can I pass a clearance? <coughs> the, the number one rule you want to abide by is full disclosure. If they catch you lying about it, many times the lie itself is worse than what you were lying about. So the lie is more significant than the underlying conduct. And I'll tell you, when I first came into the Bureau in 1995, all new agents out in Newark, New Jersey, where I started, were assigned to the applicant squad. So we would go out, make sure the applicants were correct, watch their testing scores, all of that, do their background. The very last thing they get is the polygraph exam. And at that point, um, they are asked a variety of questions on an investigation that spanned probably 20 years, because it's top secret clearance. We were averaging like three, or four pe three out of four people a week were flunking the polygraph, and they weren't even getting on the machine itself. It was in the pre-polygraph interview. At that time, you were allowed experimental use of marijuana, which was considered six uses or less. People would come in and say, on my application, I put, I never lied, or excuse me, I never used marijuana, and they signed that application under oath. They come in, they see the polygraph examiner, they say, yeah, I used it two or three times, but I was afraid to put that down. I thought I would be looked at in a disparaging manner, and it's not the case. So the polygraph examiner has no choice. That exam is shut down, your application is closed, and we will retain it as a failed polygraph. So if you apply to any other law enforcement or intelligence agency out there, they're going to come to us and request a copy of that, and we will release that through proper mechanisms. So you shoot yourself in the foot. With that being said, the, the drug usage is the top reason why people flunk polys. I would encourage you, just to be open and honest, the drug usage policy is a lot more liberal. In fact, I heard CIA was saying something to the effect, as long as you haven't used it within one year of your investigation, you're going to be okay, your background investigation. Or you can't use it if you're in official capacity. So if you're in the military or you're a police officer, you can't use in that capacity. Um, our application process is all online, and people will come to that question. Did you use marijuana? Did you use hardcore drugs? And they'll put no, submit the application, and then they'll send us an email saying, well, I really used it, but I wanted my application just to go forward. At that point, day number two, their application is closed. The issue that I convey to people is there's no level of law enforcement that look, is looking for you know, perfect people. None of us are perfect. We've all made mistakes. Um, disclose it and minimize it. Because what happens is you will have a situation where you fly through the exams and whatever else you have to do in your background. Uh, maybe you have a uh, simple assault, you're getting into fighting, or maybe there's a domestic dispute situation, or maybe you haven't paid your student loans, or you have delinquent credit cards. That will cause you to have a problem with your security clearance. So if we have two applicants equally accomplished, and one has some kind of problem, it's highly likely that the other one is going to get through the process first and get hired. And it's almost a bit of luck to get hired with the government because you're dealing with budgets. And I have seen people go through, they pass the test, they sail through everything, they pass their background, and they get told, Congress just shut, shut down funding, we're not doing any new agent class for another year at least. And what happens? If a year goes by, they've got to start all over again. So you want to get through that application process as quickly as possible. When you graduate, keep in touch with one or two of your professors. That will help us. We want to have someone to contact who could say, yeah, he or she was here, they did a good job, they were respectful. When you go through your four years, be very careful who you live with. Even if you don't get charged, even if they don't get charged, we're still going to contact the campus public safety department and find out. And if there's anything where you're referenced in a report, it's not the end of the world, but we still have to follow up on it and see what their thoughts were. Student loans, a very big one, in particular with any aspect of the intelligence community. As a full-time employee or as a contract employee, they don't want you in a leveraged position. They want to make sure you can pay your bills. Uh, a lot of students will get a credit card and they'll keep rolling that balance over. That's another one we see very common. You want to avoid that. You can Google search uh, federal security clearance and see the forms that you will have to apply. So take a look at it in advance. Some people in college will move four or five times in the span of four years. Keep track of your landlord. Keep track of your roommates so that we have people we can talk to. They might say good. They might say bad. We've seen it all. 
uh, there's some stories that would make the hair on the back of your neck stand up with some of the background checks I've done, and the people still pass because they're honest about it. So I would, I, if you have that interest, I would start keeping track of who you're living with, credit cards, student loan debt, all of that. Lots of opportunities. Are there any more questions? Any concerns? All right, well, we'll be around for a little bit. If you have anything and you want to ask more informally, certainly feel free to reach out. We'll stay up here for a couple minutes and address your concerns. Thank you.